Okay, so what I can anticipate to you is that uh, we thought of organizing this webinar series uh, starting from common reflections done past year with uh, colleagues of the center and with colleagues uh, working at the University of Trento at the Department of Philosophy. And that's the reason because the series has been developed in partnership uh, uh, by both uh, the centers of religious studies at the Bruno Kressler Foundation and the Department of Philosophy. Last year, uh, a colleague from Cameroon, uh, from Cameroon was uh, spending his year of, uh, as visiting a scholar in Trento. So we thought why we cannot uh, recuperate this notion of global health we already worked on and try to reason on the difficult uh, condition and scenario we are dealing with. So we thought uh, our past work, our past project on global faith-based organization was uh, something as a main reflection we had done a main starting point and uh, we wanted since a long time to have the opportunity to talk also to involve other people who are committed in global health uh, to reason with us and uh, looking forward to understand what we can do right now considering uh, the new profile global health has uh, strongly assumed uh, during uh, the last uh, year. So I thank all of you for coming. I will uh, introduce, introduce uh, the speakers of our episode. Uh, I start with uh, Betty Jacobs, uh, who is a professor of health system administration at Georgetown University. She is also scholar and the co-founder of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown. Um, Betty has worked on effective and responsible responses uh, and structure that promote uh, human flourishing uh, in healthcare in particular. And she has worked a lot with uh, the Cherokee Nation and indigenous community in the United States. Uh, Betty, uh, uh, we met Betty thanks to a common colleague who is uh, Kevin Fitzgerald. Uh, Kevin and Betty proposed us to, to start uh, or to support a common project on the role of global faith-based health care organization uh, in, uh, in the developing countries and uh, in, in the treatment, in caring for the most vulnerable people. So that's uh, the, the main point uh, that uh, uh, offered to all of us, gave to us the opportunity to start reasoning on these uh, peculiar organizations and realities. Um, during the project, which lasts uh, uh, three years and is still some way going on and um, we invited to to join the group and the project people coming from different countries especially from um, from um, from uh, african countries from south asian countries and i think of bangladesh india and uh, um, and, and, and a colleague came also from Colombia at some point. Uh, Bruce Compton joined us as a representative and uh, as senior director of global health in one of these associations, the Catholic Health Association of the United States. Uh, Bruce is based in the St. Louis office of the CAJ and he is responsible uh, in like to say in global uh, organization um, in, 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 in especially in the supply chain system so uh, the, du the main duties of Bruce include facilitating collaboration among uh, organizations and partners uh, trying to bring like to say uh, intervention in the best and most pertinent way in, in country all around the world. 
Uh, Jean-Philippe Cobot is a, a colleague, a lawyer and a philosopher, is the director of the Centre for Medical, for Le Centre d'Ethique Médicale, the Centre for Medical Ethics at the Catholic University in Lille. He is professor of medical ethics there and uh, mm, he is engaged in and involved in many uh, bioethics and medical ethics association at a European and a more global level. Um, Jean-Philippe works on clinical ethics and organizational ethics and he is teaching also public health at the Louvain-Lanove University in Belgium. Gianni Tognoni is a physician uh, and not only a physician, he spent his life as a researcher at my Rio Negri Institute, but Gianni has a very unique, I think, profile because he has always paid a, a strong attention to ethics and human rights, both working on in ethics committees and in research ethics committees, but um, also in, in reflection and centers where the attention to ethics and human rights in clinical research, in the epidemiological research has been always very very high and very strong. In, um, in his uh, work, he has dedicated a peculiar attention to communitarian epidemiology. He has led uh, um, projects in South America and in African countries. And right now he is uh, strongly committed as uh, in the human rights field as uh, a secretary of the People Permanent Tribunal. Um, so I now I leave the floor to Marco Ventura for uh, a welcome and I will try to let Michele Nicoletti enter the meeting because he cannot access for some reason. So I, I leave the floor to Marco. Thank you all for coming, to all of you for coming. Th 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 thank you very much and a uh, uh, warm welcome from my side and the director of the Center for Religious Studies at Fondazione Bruno Kessler. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for all of you for being uh, with us uh, uh, again. Um, I think that the gift of Lucia, as we uh, are about to start this third episode in the series, is uh, to be able to, to, to build uh, uh, a very coherent conversation, a deep one, on issues of um, high, high relevance. Uh, uh, today, but at the same time, uh, part of the gift is to be able to give some depth um, to our reflection. So it's both topical and and uh, um, with regard to our everyday um, preoccupations, but it's also you know something that um, enables us to um, achieve some some perspective, which we uh, are so much in need of. Um, um, I would also like to acknowledge again pa uh, another part of the of, of the gift of the special gift um, Lucia Galvani is endowed with, which is uh, to be able to build in continuity. And, and in fact, all, all, all the people who are present at, at these episodes uh, um, have been chosen based on uh, past experiences and past involvement in a way or in another in their research, in the research of the, of the center, which makes uh, uh, this episode, as the others, a um, uh, very, very uh, dense in uh, terms of uh, uh, being rooted in, in, in ongoing partnerships and in, in, in ongoing projects. So this is not a sparse event, as the others are, known, are not. Uh, the, this is a part of an ongoing multilateral, multi-voice uh, uh, endeavor, and uh, I, I'm very much uh, grateful for this to her and, and, and to all of you. So once again, welcome very, very much to Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Uh, thanks to Isabella Mazze, who's, who's uh, 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 granting, uh, um, as usual, uh, a strong support. And, and the floor is back to Lucia for uh, finally starting the, our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Okay, Michele, 
Of course. So, Michele, thank you for joining us. Uh, no, thanks to you. Sorry for the delay. No, it's fine. We just uh, introduced the speakers. So, Michele is uh, uh, a colleague, uh, professor of political philosophy at, at the Department of Philosophy of the University of Trento, and he is the co we co-organized uh, this webinar series. So. Uh, I leave the floor to Betty for the initial uh, um, for her initial intervention and uh, and thank you to all of you for for this uh, confrontation we will build. We don't hear you. Sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I, I've clicked enough buttons, but not quite. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join with you today. It's a small audience, but it's a good number for a conversation. And uh, I appreciate uh, the introduction uh, Lucia has uh, outlined for our topic today and Marco uh, placing it in context of a larger, richer, uh, di the multifaceted dimensions that uh, make up the human experience. And today we will talk about global health, ethics and technology, uh, but it is part of uh, the larger human experience and how uh, our responsibility to uh, others uh, can play out in so many different arenas. So it, it's been about four years ago uh, since uh, I met uh, Marco uh, and uh, we had a, a discussion about uh, some of the needs, opportunities and uh, uh, current issues uh, related to global health uh, and, and the human experience. Uh, it, in particular, because much of my background has uh, involved uh, systems and some of the practical, difficult uh, decisions that uh, leaders must make in uh, large systems. Uh, our invitation for uh, conversation uh, included uh, such uh, fine uh, esteemed uh, leaders as uh, Bruce Compton, who's here today, uh, uh, Bruce Wilkinson from CMMB, um, Colleen Scanlon, uh, active in global health through uh, Dignity uh, and other uh, venues, uh, scholars, <coughs> and uh, scientists. Uh, eventually, uh, we also have included some frontline healthcare workers to inform the discussions we had, not just about global health, but global faith-based organizations that uh, respond to the same complexities and challenges that global health uh, organizations uh, around the world uh, must uh, address. <clears throat> uh, the, the topic is not uh, innovative in and of itself. In, indeed, uh, our uh, participants that uh, we have worked with over years uh, knew each other. We uh, encounter each other in other uh, venues. Uh, but there is uh, a, a time to have uh, the um, off-site uh, deeper discussions that uh, <clears throat> let us examine in small sessions uh, and, and with a, a mirror that allows some self-criticism, uh, you know, what seems to be working, what is our mission, how we live it out, um, what um, have we not done so well? What, what are the uh, troubling matters? So uh, to, to summarize some years uh, and long conversations, I, I'd like to talk about uh, three 
domains that, that we have covered and sh share a, a little bit uh, about uh, the uh, uh, main topics that uh, weave into these uh, three pathways to promote human flourishing. One is uh, the, the notion of dignity of the individual and respect for the communities. And uh, I will talk about uh, how faith-based uh, organizations have uh, uh, really invested in um, uh, a, an attempt to, to do this and, and to overcome some uh, uh, difficulties that uh, have happened e either in the past or, or in current circumstances. Certainly, uh, it turns out that technology uh, has been uh, a focal point for this group uh, right along. Uh, the intention was to look at uh, resources and the gains of, uh, that technology can provide in terms of efficiencies, uh, quality, uh, standardization, and uh, then to uh, deal with uh, so some of the difficulties that uh, technology brings along with that. Uh, the third pathway uh, is best practices, what, what people actually do, uh, aspire to do, and must get done, and uh, what we evaluate. Uh, today, I, I'd also like to speak about best practices in the context of a concurrent phenomenon I, I work on quite a bit that um, has some uh, intersection uh, with faith-based organization, it, and it's the uh, experience of decolonization and the uh, activities around um, uh, self-determination uh, for uh, communities. And uh, it, it's not exactly the same as governments, but there's enough uh, shared variance that um, uh, I, I think it's relevant to discuss. So it, in terms of uh, our uh, discussions on mission uh, and uh, the uh, dignity of individual and respect for communities, uh, while uh, faith-based organizations have been independent uh, and see themselves as independent from government, organizations, uh, their uh, lived experience within many communities in the developing world came at the same time, uh, in the same way that St. Ignatius uh, jumped on the boats with the, the explorers, the age of discovery. Uh, there were uh, missionaries and uh, uh, service workers who did come with uh, armies. Uh, so for some communities that um, that experience um, was concurrent and, and maybe even conceptualized as the same. Certainly from a historical point, uh, there were the habits and uh, reflection points of uh, power that came uh, with um, the uh, outsiders that uh, became uh, decision makers, helpers, and, and guides. Uh, I, I think it's important to, to note uh, and to recognize that in the writings of, of many people and the uh, impulse, uh, the uh, philosophical underpinnings of why people came to uh, provide health care was uh, for the dignity of uh, in all people. Uh, it was a service to the point of sacrifice. Um, that um, lived out, uh, I, I would say, d depending on who was there, uh, it was lived out differently, uh, uh, imperfectly or better in some places. But the uh, philosophical construct was different than uh, occupation. And 
uh, our group uh, over time has uh, spent considerable time, uh, you, you know, uh, addressing the mission and uh, bolstering not just credentials uh, that uh, are important, but the kind of um, supports that are uh, critical for people who uh, are not just treating a disease, um, uh, dealing with a deficit, uh, encouraging uh, vaccination and clean water, uh, but want the kind of uh, dignity and uh, flourishing that uh, is important to uh, the individuals. Uh, and uh, this has uh, you know, resulted in uh, a considerable amount of community-based uh, healthcare approaches that uh, very much engage the community rather than uh, being a transport uh, of uh, su supplies that uh, are needed, uh, wanted, but uh, are understood and uh, appreciated uh, by the community. Um, much of healthcare has become very high tech in developing countries, we don't see, uh, you know, the monitors, the, those kinds of sophistications, uh, but our sophistication in communications, uh, our capacities in uh, supply chain and uh, coordination, um, uh, even uh, the investment, uh, many uh, faith-based organizations have done uh, with intentionality and support, and that is to uh, uh, provide the kind of professional opportunity so that there are now doctors and nurses uh, who are from the community living and working in many communities. Uh, this didn't happen by accident nor overnight. Um, it, it is uh, not evenly distributed, uh, but it, it has been uh, purposeful and uh, realized to a, a significant extent. The kinds of technology we have talked about in our Global Faith-Based Health Systems Group uh, did look at uh, the, the gains for efficiency and quality and uh, particularly, you know, what uh, people most needed and uh, wanted. One of the barriers uh, that, uh, you know, with COVID has been dismantled is that uh, technology in many ways was a support function. It uh, provided mechanisms to report data uh, to the government or uh, sponsors. Um, if uh, the workforce needed uh, continuing education or credentialing, um, needed uh, some resources. Uh, but the actual delivery of care um, has been, um, you, you know, uh, less uh, certain uh, until COVID. Uh, COVID has, uh, you know, broken uh, a lot of question marks uh, about whether or not one can uh, either uh, offer treatment, uh, health advice, uh, and uh, companion diagnostics uh, using a technology. And uh, so I think we, we're living through something uh, very important. I'd like to mention two aspects uh, related to technology that we encountered uh, in uh, the category of what I'd call unintended consequences. And, uh, you know, this is related to um, what I talked about in terms of uh, dignity and community respect and the perception of that, uh, because uh, not all bad consequences 
uh, were intended. Um, and, and it is uh, just a, a fact of life that uh, interventions um, do sometimes come with what you want it to accomplish and uh, some things that are not intended and become a problem. Uh, one thing that is accomplished through uh, technology much better is that we can standardize uh, things like quality of care uh, and uh, the uh, toolkit. We can uh, as assist people to uh, reach for uh, you know, not marginal or good enough, but uh, you know, good quality, uh, generally low tech because we don't have the expensive equipment, but uh, basic medication and uh, supervision and, and action. Uh, standardization does bring with it a kind of a thorny issue, and that is it, that it makes everything very uniform. And uh, if one is in a crisis medical situation, that, uh, that is good enough. But global faith-based health systems are very embedded in communities. They are part of communities and follow along with the life cycle and experiences. So that some of the expectation and the responsiveness is uh, to uh, customize or, or what uh, the Jesuits uh, here refer to as cura personalis, that uh, uh, it's the care of the whole person, not just the disease or episode of the moment. And, uh, you know, in talking about mission and action, it is having the skills to treat disease, to respond to uh, health needs, uh, but also to see the bigger picture. Uh, the other technology uh, problem with unintended consequences um, has been overrun during uh, COVID, uh, though it comes up, and that's the, the matter of privacy and how uh, data might be used. Uh, I, I mention this in particular because for people without power and without advocates uh, and, and for whom uh, other people are paying to uh, give things, there is sometimes the expectation uh, that they own data uh, and that this information uh, can be used. I, I, I use one uh, uh, occasion here in the United States. Uh, uh, an Indian tribe, they have a supai in Arizona, uh, participated in a, a diabetes research study with Arizona State University. Um, and uh, this was an occasion where scholars took lots of information to help out with the problem of diabetes. Um, but after a while, they, they had so much data and, you know, so many researchers, people became curious about uh, some of the scales of depression and mental health and started writing papers about the mental health disorders of the people who lived there. This was not agreed upon. Uh, the, the community was uninformed. Um, and it's that kind of uh, consequence that uh, uh, we're, we're responsible to the extent we can to avoid. Uh, so the, with that example and some of the, the lead ups, uh, we have talked uh, a, a lot about best practices, um, how uh, we can do it better, uh, not just the delivery of health care, but uniting the mission of the whole person and the opportunity that health systems have in that they are not parachuting in for a cholera outbreak only and then leaving uh, the global faith-based health systems in many places uh, are with the community 
uh, throughout uh, lifespans and, and over time. Um, and, uh, you know, there's always the question of uh, 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 it, as other uh, organizations come, is, is this uh, the right thing? Uh, but some um, activism within communities have been that they can be more participatory. Uh, the community-based response that global faith-based uh, health systems have uh, been uh, attending to for so long, uh, you know, is reflected somewhat in the aspects of uh, this phenomenon uh, in places called uh, decolonization. And it is the, the right to have uh, priorities or traditions uh, flourish uh, and uh, people to be engaged in uh, their own uh, healthcare uh, services. And uh, it, it is you know, under the banner of self-determination which the United Nations uh, has recognized for uh, indigenous peoples, which are, are you know, some of the service areas that uh, we work with in, uh, in developing countries. So uh, the, these are not e exactly the same, but uh, they uh, have some shared variants. And for either outsiders or some people within communities, uh, the uh, faith-based identity uh, gets merged with the NGO uh, identity. And the distinctiveness uh, is something that is uh, deep and rich. Um, there are in, any number of current e examples, but uh, uh, we, we have heard from Sister Bina, the medical director, uh, the hospital in Mumbai, which has uh, uh, experienced a, a serious, uh, overwhelming uh, problem with COVID cases, and uh, she's been a participant in uh, in our work. And uh, uh, the uh, the the goals for her and her staff are certainly to deal with COVID as a scourge, as a disease, uh, but to care uh, about the human experience and their spiritual uh, uh, fears and supports uh, that happen. Um, uh, th those are important things and uh, the capacity building, I think, is uh, reflected in important ways. Um, the vaccine uptake, which uh, is notoriously hesitant uh, uh, in some of these communities uh, because of capacity building and uh, community-based uh, engagement. Uh, we have seen in Australia, for example, no elders have died uh, because uh, the community has uh, placed in uh, action uh, in other places. Um, because community has been engaged, vaccines as they become available have been uh, 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 responded to and sometimes uh, very quickly because of the engagement. Uh, so there, there is a lot more to discuss. Uh, these are some highlights uh, from very rich uh, uh, intersections of, of uh, of thought, and uh, I look forward to the chance to talk to you more uh, on the same topic. Thank you, Betty, for this uh, uh, wide uh, and broad uh, uh, introduction and synthesis about uh, and summary, like to say, about uh, global health and the role of the faith based organization. Now I leave the floor to Bruce Compton to to see and to understand the, which has been the, the real contribution some organization and most particularly the Catholic Health Association, uh, Bruce works for, uh, and 
has brought uh, during the past months. Thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lucia, uh, Marco, and Betty uh, for those intros and for bringing us all together. Um, uh, Betty mentioned this is a small group. I like small groups because I think you can really accomplish things and have real conversation. Um, so uh, I'm going to just dig in and my, my goal to, is to provide a few insights into the Catholic Health Association's efforts to ensure that sustainable and equitable healthcare worldwide aren't just a vision, but become a reality. Um, Betty talked about the, the dignity of the human person, and I'm just gonna give you a little of my background to, to tell you um, how I think sometimes we miss that when we're trying to do um, good works. Uh, I, um, went to Haiti, I, I was a stockbroker um, in the financial markets in the US. I went to Haiti with my diocese here in Illinois, in the United States, um, to explore the opportunity of having a medical mission, um, to support a local clinic that was funded by the US government there. Um, a good friend of mine who was a priest led this trip um, and I went to Haiti and I was really taken by the poverty and the need and the disparity. And I um, took the opportunity to say, I really need to reflect on my life's work and um, making people money and making myself money wasn't what I was looking for. So I went to work for the diocese and led up those mission trips. And for three years, I led 13 trips to Haiti. Um, I was invited to um, move to Haiti as a result of my support of this organization to be their director of administration and finance. And um, the first time that happened, I had a few week old baby and could not take the job. But uh, luckily, two years later, they offered me the job again. My daughter was um, turning three and we moved to Haiti. And when I moved there, I saw the um, impact of what we had done in a totally different light. I saw that many of the things we had drugged to Haiti, um, medical supplies, equipment, and pharmaceuticals were not used and they were taking up space. I saw that um, others were sending things and that they weren't useful. And it really does go to the dignity of the human person. Too often, people think that what we have that is still good will be useful somewhere else, but without understanding the total context. So we, um, we, when I moved home, I worked with an order of sisters to start a new program to allow them to use technology uh, so that the sisters 15 hospitals in the United States could collect and redistribute appropriately and responsibly medical equipment, and that the people on the ground could order that equipment. Um, and uh, then after uh, that work for um, eight years, I was offered my role here at the Catholic Health Association. Um, and I'm going to put a couple of things in the chat box that so you don't have to take notes about what I'm saying. Uh, but CHA is a member organization. Um, we are uh, caring for people and communities across the United States with special attention to those who are poor and vulnerable. There are 668 Catholic hospitals in the United States. There are about 1,600 nursing facilities that are Catholic in the United States. About 800,000 people work for Catholic healthcare in the US and about one in seven patients that is cared for in the United States is cared for by one of the members of the Catholic Health Association. Um, these are parts of 35 systems which have their roots in um, doing global health. The sisters that started Catholic healthcare in the United States came from places across Europe. Um, here to the United States over a hundred years ago. So um, even our own roots are in global health. I do our um, 
global health work on behalf of our members who continue to reach out around the world. And I do that really through five mechanisms, through consultation, through research, through education and formation programs for our members about best practices in global health, by promoting collaborative projects for our members and by doing networking on behalf of our members. I will um, also put that link into the chat. Um, and then, so to get to, that's, that's plenty of background, but to get to um, how CHA does this work, I'm gonna try to summarize several efforts, uh, multiple efforts that we do um, to promote effective engagements that follow ethical, legal, and regular, regulatory standards when we are when our members are involved in global health activities. This really does go to the issue of decolonization as well, because too often we go in with this perspective of we know best. Um, and you know, then we go and tell people what they need versus listening and assessing what they need. So CHA has worked in several areas to, to look at that. We um, gathered a group of organizations that send medical equipment and supplies overseas and help to develop a set of standards and an organization that is now accrediting um, organizations that send medical surplus overseas. That's called the Med Surplus Alliance. So that is about things. Um, we also have uh, worked with and are subsidizing uh, partially a group called Advocacy for Global Health Partnerships, which is creating, which has created a declaration. We worked in collaboration with uh, the World Health Organization, the Esther Alliance for Europe, um, which is a global health partnership initiative plus many in-country partners to develop a declaration uh, and, and outline principles for ensuring that when we do short-term engagements in global health, that they're part of long-term partnerships and that uh, humility, cultural sensitivity, uh, sustainability, accountability, um, and bi-directionality are all a part of those relationships from the beginning. Um, I also, so that is about people and the, and the donations of their time and efforts and trying to ensure that they are effective and useful and really, um, again, taking into account that dignity of the human person. Uh, CHA also collaborates with the WHO on multiple other projects. I am currently on four um, WHO uh, initiatives where uh, work groups. Um, one of which is on health information for all. It's a catalyst group that I'm a part of. And so, so those are just a few examples of how we are working to bring um, resources and um, standards, ethical principles to our members. We do, we've done a lot of research on these things and then turned all of that into resources that we share with both our members and others. Additionally, um, we are, as, as a result of COVID, we are working uh, with a group of over 50 organizations in the United States called uh, the Catholic Cares Coalition to promote uh, equitable access and distribution of vaccines. Um, and this is both nationally and globally. Uh, we are just getting ready to write an, an uh, well, uh, we have, CHA has drafted a letter to President Biden, who will be going to the G7 next week to try and uh, engage him in larger conversations about uh, the need to share um, our, share the vaccine and to equitably distribute globally and to get the others from the G7, uh, the G20, and all of our global partners to to work on multiple efforts to, to ensure that uh, vaccines are equitably distributed. Um, we have also, as a result of COVID, um, had several special networking opportunities. Uh, Betty mentioned Sister Bina, who is from India. She's the 
Uh, she's a sister doctor. She's the president of the Sister Doctor Forum. Uh, we're working closely with Sister Bina and the Sister Doctor Forum to try and understand how we might be able to assist them. Uh, we have the Hilton Foundation for Sisters, foundations and donors interested in Catholic activities, and others who are in con uh, conversation with them as the result of our, uh, number one, as the result of this convening of, of, of that Betty talked about where Sister Bina was there, but number two, because CHA then called this special networking call, Sister Bina was one of the presenters and it put him in touch with some of these other donors that are really trying to assist uh, in, this, uh, in this area. We had another networking call with South America um, and we are following up today to work on some supply chain issues um, and even working with the US military to provide free transport for some of the faith-based institutions uh, where the military would have partnerships uh, in those countries. Um, and then finally, um, we're, we're constantly, I went to my first in-person meeting yesterday. I came home late last night. Um, the, I'll put a, a link to that America Magazine article about, it was a special meeting of the Bishops' Conference of the United States, as well as representatives from Bishops' Conference in Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Um, to talk about border issues. And CHA was invited into this conference with the, ba the Vatican and the Bishops' Conference to provide insights about how healthcare uh, might take part in, um, in being a part of that. So I will also put that link, as I said, into the, into the chat. Um, my second piece was to identify several models for capacity building and resource sharing highlighted um, by the many global health coalitions we participate, and I'll be very quick. Uh, we're working on developing a formation program for our members who do global health so that they understand that this whole idea of ethics, um, equity, legal and regulatory standards and, and quality. Um, we, uh, as I've already mentioned, work to uh, uh, on a supply chain standards program, but we are now working uh, with a corporation, with several non-governmental organizations, not-for-profit organizations, um, and with uh, the standards organization to do a supply chain pilot. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, Marco, uh, this is one of those places where technology could really be helpful. Um, we, we have actually wondered how uh, even uh, blockchain might be brought into something to try and bring uh, data back and to provide some sort of incentive for those partners to give that data. So having a token and a blockchain, and I'm speaking well beyond my understanding of that even by talking like that. So, but I do think there's opportunity um, with technology and with new technology to transfer some of that. Um, we're working with the Pope's, uh, the Pope's uh, Mission Society um, here in the United States, um, providing um, really capacity building to them as they have created an investment fund to uh, provide loans in Africa. They started in agriculture, they're moving to education and now to healthcare. And so we are building a cadre of our members that will help advise them as they give these loans to communities of religious sisters and brothers uh, in Africa to help build their healthcare. But a very different paradigm when you think of a loan versus the typical grant that you would get in global health. So we're working to do some due diligence. We've introduced them to CFOs, to some people that can help to do assessments um, to ensure that if they give them a loan, they'll be able to pay back a low interest loan. Um, we're also working with the Vatican's Dicastery for Integral Human Development on a project around water, sanitation, and hygiene in global health facilities. And um, I will stop there, uh, but um, a lot going on with CHA and our members that are really trying to um, 
activate many of the things for our membership that Betty talked about. And what I really, you know, have great hopes for this, uh, the the, organ, the the coalition that, that Betty and Marco have brought together in Trento over the last four years is that we can do that on a more global scale. So thank you, Marco, Lucia, for the opportunity. Thank you, Bruce, for your presentation and, and synthesis of, uh, of all these uh, uh, engaging and demanding activities. I think now we can leave the floor to Jean-Philippe Cobot, who, Jean-Philippe, okay, you, you should open the microphone. Unmute the microphone and thank you. So, <clears throat> um, thank you very much for your invitation and uh, I, I'm very happy to be there and to be able to have the opportunity to to discuss this this important question um perhaps my point will be a little bit different uh, uh even uh, I, I believe uh, in in uh, several points uh, really in line with uh, what uh, betty and bruce uh, said just before um uh, during this uh, almost two years um, period uh, of covid my main my main question was what kind what kind of governance uh, covid uh, situation uh, need and and uh, perhaps uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, large uh, large question but, but um I find in, in different um, in different in different contribution uh, some uh, interesting um, uh, contribution to the, to the to this question and um, what what I would like uh, to 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 say in this brief contribution is to reflect around which public health ethics for flourishing and resilient communities and individuals uh, in this situation because uh, my argument is more or less this one uh, um, and the starting point is the management of the crisis uh, was characterized uh, through a focus uh, a, a main focus on the diasis on the covid itself as betty said and uh, in a relatively uh, centralized political and scientific governance way uh, to, to manage uh, this question. Um, and um, in a very interesting article uh, uh, published uh, in the Age of um, Journal uh, around this question, uh, Jennifer Ruger, um, uh, ask for a, a positive public health ethics more based more based on flourishing and resilient community uh, and individuals and in my uh, contribution I, I would like to to follow the uh, argument uh, on this on this question and, and on this the importance of shared governance health governance and um, I, I I try perhaps to specify a little bit this question of shared governance in uh, underline the question in the, and the importance of uh, 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 an experimentalist uh, and a reflective governance of these questions and by experiment experimentalist i mean something like um, uh, like embedded uh, a governance embedded in the community's experience uh, and practice uh, the consequence of the crisis uh, as underlying uh, jennifer rugers um, is uh, very important and, and uh, the extent of, of mobility and mortality uh, uh, some sort of social chaos 
economic disturbances, disruption of the labor market, uh, the many impacts on education, the impacts of the every area of life, uh, including individuals and communities' abilities to work, exercise their faith, practice their religion, uh, vote, exercise their civil and political rights. And the data suggests also uh, treats uh, of COVID-19 is, is disproportionately an impact on racial minorities and vulnerable people. And uh, more globally, the individual and the community's ability to be healthy, uh, to avoid premature mortality and preventable morbidity, uh, and to even just survive. Uh, so, uh, what, what kind of um, public health ethics uh, can develop? Um, uh, we, we can we can sustain in this in this kind of situation in order to address to face uh, this kind of crisis, this one and perhaps the 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 the, the, the next one. Um, this uh, this field, this academic field and um, apply policy field um, need for Jennifer Rigor and I I'm, I'm agree with with, uh, with, with her uh, an enlargement of ethical theory in public health and in health policy um, to address social determinants of health, social justice and collective concern. In order to re respond to the crisis, uh, we need to push to put forth um, an public health ethics uh, spe steeped in human flourishing, uh, embodiment of mutual interdependence and shared vulnerabilities, um, presenting a set of ethical standards for building and operating a robust public health system for resilient individual and community in order to develop and implement systems to reduce threats to and safeguard individuals and communities' ability to flourish. What, in my view, was missing a lot during the period we have just lived. I think we must also, perhaps beyond the Jennifer Ruger framework of cap capabilities, in phasing the importance of an ov overcoming of the opposition between individuals and common interests. We need also to pay more attention to the mutual interdependence and the, and the short vulnerabilities that the crisis has brought for, to, to the fore, and um, also to pay atten more attention to the community process to address uh, difficult situations and questions they face. In my experience, my little experience, not uh, uh, in in France and in Belgium, um, what happened in the nursing home, for example, is is a very important to 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 see how um, the caregivers and the residents of these nurse, nursing home who face many peremptory rules, uh, find some sort of salvation in the possibility to experiment collectively, which uh, together, uh, how to develop solution and to face the difficulties they, uh, they, they encounter in this, in this period. The, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has proven that our global society and economy and our domestic societies and economies are mutually 
interdependent and share vulnerabilities through population movement, travel, supply and demand change of good, goods and services, re re revenue and, and, and expenses. And uh, for to, to, to meet the, this kind of um, uh, question, um, we uh, neglect, ne neglect a, a sufficient investment in global and do domestic public health uh, is in inadequate and, and, and moreover it, it exacerbates the change the, the, the chance of another pandemic. The current system cannot accommodate the pervasive independence inter interdependence and interaction involved in the in the global and in domestic public health such as the constant individual communities and population interaction. And in this experience, health uh, is, an uh, is, an, is an essential aspect of our lives. Health risks are integrally linked to other kinds of risk, including our ability to be educated, to work, to engage so socially with family and friends. So what kind of ethics uh, we need to, to face this situation uh, to uh, be able to have a, a global and domestic public health uh, oriented toward a, a common good and securing opportunity to flourish for everyone. Human flourish rooted in equal respect for all humans and encapsulating human capability, particularly the central health capabilities, need what Jennifer Ruger uh, speak, uh, uh, named a provincial globalism. In the sense of global health justice is respectful and morally uh, equal treatment for all people. Central health capabilities as moral morally salient human characteristics and collective collaboration is needed to create an effective global society oriented around promoting human flourishing and developing health capability. In my view, uh, as I mentioned it before, the collective collaboration aspect is really a central one. A central one. In this perspective, the notion of health governance is really a key concept. Chart health governance, as mentioned by Jennifer Ruger, for common goods is a key con concept for, uh, for, uh, for a fighting uh, against epidemics and pandemics which is a, a shared uh, health streets, produce shared vulnerabilities and need a global and domestic public health system, which requires shared resource, shared sovereignty, shared responsibility. This shared health governance allocate specific roles and responsibilities to individuals, communities, governments, and international institutions based on their abilities to articulate around a social rationality and through actor genuine efforts in collective action with dirty duties of cooperation, of developing and protecting health capabilities. Achieving health equity requires the authentic cooperation of interdependent individuals and groups to internalize their respective responsibilities. In this perspective, the duties are distributed according to the functional abilities of global, national, local, 
and individual actors in this distribution it seems to me as well as someone like mika esser that the communities are a very important locus and it is particularly important to pay special attention to processual and reflexive life of the of these independent interdependent individuals in these communities as base to construct knowledge and tools to prepare and to, and, and to fight against uh, uh, pandemics. In conclusion, uh, this chart held governance as mutual collective accountability is a multi-level, multi-actor, cohesive and comprehensive framework for sharing power and responsibility to address global and domestic public health problems. This creates processes for actors at all levels and of all size. In, and in this perspective, we need to pay a special attention to most affected and to most vulnerable groups in order to be main, meaningful fully in this health governance. Shared health governance and provincial globalism provide a country, a contrafactual paradigm for a positive public health ethics and a change and a change in moral attitude one that shifts the focus from the diseases and the risk factor to individuals and communities' capabilities. From my point of view, it is possible to deepen this, capab this capabilities approach by, pay by paying more attention and drawing on experiences, as in the experimentalist governance model uh, of some people as uh, uh, Charles Sables of the communities and developing a reflexive and a genetic approach to health governance. This systemic reform could be turned or systemic fragility in face of the pandemics into a systemic resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, merci Jean-Philippe. It is like uh, you, you brought a, a more theoretical contribution that helps us to understand also the complexity, I think, of the reality we are dealing with. Uh, thank you so much. And now I leave the floor to Gianni Tognoni, who will uh, offer uh, his discussant perspective and then we will have time for a confrontation. Thank you, Gianni. Okay. Uh, my role, as, as you have said, Lucia, is the role of discussion. So while uh, fully appreciating uh, all the experience which have been proposed at community level, I think that uh, would be important to start some, some facts which are more structural facts on the line of the last contribution. Uh, if we see the international uh, literature over the last uh, 15 years, uh, there is one common trend, uh, the uh, growing uh, role of uh, inequalities in all fields uh, of society and specifically in health. The main editorials of main uh, journal uh, underline obviously that uh, inequality leads to inequity. And in that sense, uh, this statement uh, is accompanied dramatically with the fact that uh, the growing inequality and the growing inequity is declared unavoidable in the sense that the development models uh, declare that uh, economic point of view is the leading factor, while uh, public health is declared ethically mandatory in fact, uh, the role of public health in all countries is decreasing, with a partial exception in the States, with uh, the Obamacare and different things, but with all the difficulties. 
In that sense, uh, it's clear that the pandemic uh, has simply put clear that uh, the uh, global experience uh, of being the victims of a known and unknown virus uh, has created uh, further inequalities and further inequities in the sense that uh, and the vaccine story which is still uh, our daily experience has shown that in fact uh, the universal interpretation of globality is excluded global interests uh, are in fact those who are respected universal rights uh, which have to do with uh, all nobody left behind uh, as in fact declared uh, a kind of a dependent variable if the money is there if the vaccine is there they will be given in a future the life and right to life of individuals is not a matter of today is left to next year in two years uh, when the big uh, players uh, will decide that that is the time for that and in that sense i think that the critical role of uh, this uh, contradiction between the global approach and the universal approach in favor of a global approach which has to do with the goods and not with people is in fact the principal paradigm which should be reversed i think that is in at the end uh, the main message over the last years uh, of Pope Francisco, who is always saying, and the initiative with the young economists is clearly going in that direction, that if we are not able to reverse the hierarchy between economy and uh, human rights uh, as a vision of our future, all our effort at community level will be ethically well-placed and mandatory but uh, they could be seen as a way of uh, qualifying ethics something which is done on ethical ground which is very good but uh, ethics could substitute the attention to the fundamental human rights which have to do with the general structure of a society in that sense uh, i think that the pandemic uh, uh, has been declared uh, a test for our capacity of being humans, simply. The challenge has been already posed by the migration. Uh, humans have become, in the pandemic, all migrants. If you see what happens in Brazil, where uh, even under religious criteria, uh, the pandemic is diffusing today together with uh, really the, uh, the dictatorship. The same is true for India. India is capable of producing all vaccine which could be done, but there is a, a Modi government which is producing a disaster, and there is not an international capacity of calling with their name what is happening. So I think that one of the major contribution from the point of view of uh, global faith-based organization should be really to adopt structurally the language of Pope Francisco in the sense that he's really calling with their name what is happening, is a crime, is not simply something to be uh, supported, is a crime, should be clearly condemned, is out of our civil engagement and perspective. That is very important because uh, the training of our uh, next generation, as we call it, or the young uh, uh, people should be really trained in that idea that either we have a vision for the middle long term future or we are in fact obliged, not because we want that, but because we are obliged by what is going on to be the spectators of what's going on without having projects to change. And those projects should be political, social, cultural projects. I think that the language, again, I insist I'm not uh, insisting in that, but I think one of the main ethic revolution 
is really the change of the language, which is included in the encyclical perspective of the Pope, which are recognized, in fact, as a possible visions. But our economic leaders, they are saying they are the leaders of a governance, but governance is a very strange term, saying that nobody's taking responsibility. Everybody's talking, but nobody's deciding. And things are going on as even before. And I think in uh, that point, I concluded. So my contribution to the discussion, I think it would be very important from the religious groups. And in that sense, uh, religion, not only the Christians, which are also divided among themselves because they are not so united at the higher level. I think that is important to, to see where the pandemic and the vaccine issue should be examined really as a diagnostic exercise to identify the new priorities, which should be really to take the inequalities as a economic category, as a category of dividing what is legitimate and what is not legitimate, even if it is legal. There is a very good uh, editorial in the England Journal of Medicine, which is talking about the legal epidemiology, saying that the epidemiology, which is respecting the economic rules, is in fact a misinformation. It's not a production of visibility of people, it's a problem of visibility of diseases, of drugs, of markets, of accessibility in terms of supply chains, but humans are discarded from the whole scenario. And I think that we have uh, to look for in community epidemiology to give always space to indicators of human development and respect of life. And everything which is in fact producing further victims as is the delays in vaccine and something like that is really a crime. And if, if we are able, as a group of religions, to call these things with these words, that could create a different approach, a different way of looking at that, and to declare that something is really intolerable. What is happening, uh, again, and if we were able, as a group representing global uh, faith-based organization, to take this uh, charge, the responsibility, I think that would be really an important in contribution, which is not obviously excluding all the community involvement, but we have to see that the community involvement is simply an important exercise. It would be good to see the young economist uh, by the Pope. Uh, Gianni. No, maybe he missed the or he touched uh, uh, I think so. Let's see if we can have him back some way. Check. Okay, I think maybe, no, okay, Gianni has left the meeting. Maybe we can, uh, awaiting for him, uh, I think we can also start uh, with uh, some exchanges among us or questions, if there are direct questions, maybe there, there are some, and, uh, and also simply on observations and reflections, these, uh, okay. Michele, I leave you the floor. Thank you. You are mute. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all the speakers and the uh, discussant uh, for, for this very stimulating 
uh, speeches and uh, interventions. Um, my question is related to the uh, relationship between medicine and religion. Uh, since you are a, in a in a quite interesting perspective, you you have experienced this COVID crisis, and y your emphasis uh, uh, about the religious reaction to the pandemics was uh, on ethical issues, hmm? um, distributive justice, inequalities, and so on. Um, I would like to ask you if you don't see more in depth uh, the necessity of analyzing what is happening to the relationship between medicine and religion in, in our days. So it is clear that uh, for our society, medicine is a substitute of, of religion. And on the other side, uh, uh, religion itself uh, is sometimes uh, understanding itself uh, as a kind of medicine. You, you have quoted Pope Francis, um, whom I, I admire, uh, very frank, uh, but he defined the church as a filled hospital. So he uses this kind of metaphor, accepting the fact uh, that uh, the perception of religion today is something that has to do uh, with the uh, medicine, with hospital, with the problem of health and so on. So if we do accept this kind of medicalization of religion on one side and sacralization of medicine on the other side, I I'm not sure that we uh, are able to react uh, in the right way uh, because the, 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 the risk is a kind of a subalternity of religion to the medical language, uh, to medical issues. Uh, for example, take the example of vaccines. Uh, when we all realized the importance of, vac of vaccination, all the emphasis was uh, on the equal access to vaccines, which is absolutely right from political progressive personalities uh, nobel prizes and so on everybody has said uh, we need a universal access to the vaccine and this is true but we have forgot that there are a lot of other things uh, that impede the people to have a stronger immunity for example the access to drinkable water uh, so we do spend a lot of money for vaccine, which is completely right. But on the other side, we do not spend so much money or so much energy to strengthen the empowerment of the single individual at global level. All the kind of uh, reaction is on having this kind of measures, technical measures, in order to face the crisis. So ethical and technological mm, answers. And uh, I don't know if there is an anthropological answers uh, at uh, the necessary mm, uh, level of, of, the, of, the, of the challenge of our time. So th this would be my question for you. Thank you, Michele, for this. That uh, brings us back to the to a main question, I think, and it is the role of religion and also of spirituality in this, uh, in a in a global health crisis. I mean, which kind of uh, salvation are we searching for? For some aspects, if there is something that is the physical uh, aspects, but there is clearly like. A, um, Okay, I leave the floor to the speakers uh, for their answers and I try to see if uh, Gianni can come back. Uh, he is back. 
I don't know whether can you hear me? Jan, yes, we were. Yes, no, you I, are back. Thank you. I disappeared, but uh, hopefully I'm back. Hopefully I will stay there. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I was quoting vaccine, and um, but in the sense that uh, uh, was uh, mentioned now before, vaccine is simply uh, uh, the last model of something which is a common good and a human right. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, today all the interests are concentrated on a vaccine is in fact producing the um, marginalization of what is public health in terms of, as you say, access to food, uh, water, everything. And in fact, uh, what I was mentioning for uh, Brazil and India, to mention the two major conditions, they are in fact having what they call now is a new term, a syndemic, because they are structural pandemics. And on the top of that, uh, there is the vaccine. And with the accuse of vaccine provision, they are discarding even more what should be the basic needs, because in Brazil, which is in fact uh, a place where people are dying, like in India, for lack of food, lack of water, whatever, are in fact considered to be now to be readmitted in the attention only if they correspond to an economic chapter of the general global intention. Water has never become and is never becoming, nor in our countries, a part of the global challenges. On the opposite, water is put among the goods which should have a market values. And in that sense, food is the same. Uh, people are dying, uh, young children who are not candidate for vaccine. They are continuing to die for the absence of vaccine, water, food. In that sense, I was saying that till uh, we are not able to take back health to uh, human right, so li right to life, and is still health a chapter of economy, because that is the situation. Economy is never discussed in uh, all the countries as a chapter of human rights. It's discussed as an accessibility to market goods, technology or whatever, drugs and something like that. But the, this change of language and of qualification of the priorities, I think is a cultural challenge. You could call, I would agree, an anthropological problem, but is really, my claim is really not to make medicine the center of the problem, but to make uh, the human right to life and dignity the real problem and to see what is the possible response but that is never in the agenda in the agenda in europe uh, vaccine are entering in the agenda nothing else uh, migrants are not in the agenda and uh, the life and death of migrants is also a big problem of public health uh, and those who are uh, lo losing the job by millions are not in the agenda because what is in the agenda is the distribution of money to developing the same model of development. And that is really a major cultural challenge and a research uh, challenge because uh, everybody is uh, doing work on how to optimize the economic algorithm, but nobody is really changing the indicators of human rights. Perhaps Lucia? Please. Uh, yeah, please. Perhaps I, I, can, I, can, I can try a little answer. I am completely agree with your diagnos diagnosis uh, and the, the inacceptab inacceptable uh, uh, status of the situation. Perhaps, and it is what I try to, to say in my, in my speech, in my contribution, uh, but that perhaps the, the little difference is in the, the possible answer to this uh, situation. 
I believe, as you, that human rights are uh, fundamental, but uh, we, we need perhaps go further than or through the human right, uh, uh, still the situation, the concrete situation and the experience of people who are in this difficult, very difficult situation in order to be conscious of this situation, but also it's the way in which we can try to change the, 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 this, this situation with the people in this situation, because um, often when we try to, 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 to do that without the people, and it's, it's a, a, a big experience in, in, in the COVID uh, management, in my view, many things uh, uh, have been done without the people directly concerned by the problem and 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 so uh, uh, i i, I my, my my point in the contribution is to try to go through capabilities or through human rights uh, 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 till the situation the concrete situation the concrete experience uh, of the people Thank you, Jean-Philippe. I think this is a main point. I understand. I think all of us understood the, the point. It's like to say, how can we engage the people in, in a lot of decisions have been done uh, on them and how can we involve and allow participation in a way that maybe improves also the awareness. But I don't know if it is just that you wanted to underscore. It's like a form of restitution of the main capabilities that come from Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen uh, studies, not only by the, their contribution, but the, they, they worked a lot both on the economical, for the economical uh, approach and the, for an anthropological and the, and the ethical approach too, like to say, which are the main traits of uh, of people and of human beings we have to, to protect, to preserve in order to improve their own ability to, to, to be committed for their life or their not just becoming, like to say, object of others' decisions also in, in communitarian and political terms. So. Perhaps a, 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 just a little bit comment on, on the, the, con, the on the notion of governance, uh, on on which you are a little bit uh, uh, sceptical, uh, and I can understand that. Just to to just to underline the fact that governance is is a, a notion is not no decision is a, a plural a plural decision making process. Uh, from the locus where the problem are, and, and to and in my view, if we if we need to to uh, uh, to 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 fight again the hegemony of economies economic uh, the economic system, we need to 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 multiply to to uh, the, the the locus uh, where we can where we can fight this hegemony when we can uh, discuss the consequence of uh, 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 almost economicist uh, and only economicist system. Yes, I think we, we need a lot. Of, I, I agree on that. It's like to say you can um, and improve or enhance local communities, but without a possibility to have an impact on a larger level, there is not a real, like to say, enhancement or not a real endorsement of these communities. And so there is, like to say, an universal attention and dedication, and then we need 
uh, to to work on the local uh, dimension and level I, I agree absolutely and it's true that uh, religion can have also a very pervasive uh, um, uh, capacity to enter and work both on a local and, and on a local and on a universal level then there there are limits also that religion bring with themselves so it's not like to say there is a, a, a an unbelievable force i think and energy and the opportunities they can offer but at the same time there are uh, structures that uh, that are engaged and so for some aspects we should deal also with uh, uh, considering the realities that uh, uh, religion and their internal and external organization can present so it's uh, it's a movement that needs a lot of uh, of balance it's like uh, the reflective equilibrium for the philosophers i mean it's like a work where we need to balance uh, different efforts uh, and and involve the different uh, abilities and also the different uh, contribution that uh, every single reality and organization can bring because i think all of us have seen how much we can do this idea of doing the things together work all together is something that has been repeated a lot of times and it's like an effort to say what does it mean governance i think can bring this attention to engage all considering the contribution each of one can bring and limiting maybe the the limits or the the, the inabilities each reality has in itself i stop here okay I should say there is something I saw from returning to this anthropological point that is something I I care a lot for, I think. Um, we were wondering about the role of uh, spirituality, but I think also the role of ethics of uh, other humanistic fields in dealing with such uh, a great... Uh, um, healthcare crisis because there is a matter of meanings that tends to come back there is a matter of balance that is the social like to say balance but it is also a deeply personal balance i think all of us were some way impacted personally in familiar terms i mean in, in, in relational terms by what what is happening and the I think maybe in this sense, I, I, I was remembering in the past days this idea that the concept of vulnerability seem, 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 and then seems to be present in all the different religions, like to say in the main religious traditions. And the idea of answering with care seemed to be also a way to say what, how can we deal with the human condition, with this fragile condition and that is uh, clearly it's uh, destined to to flourish but it's also it has also this uh, main limit and so i think uh, this kind of uh, intervention this kind of the contribution religion can bring uh, can be seen or identified also in a, a, in a special ability to deal with uh, very vulnerable situations, uh, with the main vulnerabilities we, we are observing uh, in our countries, in our communities and all around the world. And maybe the, the way how can we take in care of, uh, of a main vulnerability that seems to be the main trait uh, of uh, um, at present, I think there is something we can bring back from from this tradition, and maybe we should. Uh, I, I speak for myself, but I think we should study a little bit more. I mean that the contribution anthropology or anthropological reflection can bring at present could be very very relevant also to deal. Uh, at an interior level, like to say, and also on a social and relational level with this matter of the main 
um, of some main limits we are experiencing. So we need the very different interventions. Some are very clinical, very extremely healthcare uh, related and public health related, but I think some other requires to realize which, which can be the main values as Jean-Philippe underscored and uh, which are the anthropological values we, we have uh, to, to restore or, or to reconsider, to think of a different way of interacting and of living our communities and our societies and with the different responsibilities clearly each of has has or can have in dealing with uh, which such a main uh, emergency mm. if uh, someone else wish to intervene i would be happy not to be the last one to to intervene because i am not in the position to do it so i Please uh, feel free. I think I should say something because I think it's very important. I think uh, in, in this, uh, during this uh, time, during this hour and then health, uh, a lot of issues came out and it would be very relevant uh, for me, maybe for some of you too, to think of uh, developing a common reflection maybe on this main issue to see because I think uh, the competencies that you brought uh, can be com very complementary to, to start uh, reflecting and discussing of, on some of these uh, uh, issues that remain open because that's uh, also our, our limit, uh, our knowledge, our skills are not, uh, uh, are not uh, um, are not enough, like to say, to, to solve the matter, but uh, sometimes bringing together competencies and expertise and, uh, and, and positions we have can help also to say, what can we develop? Let's think about that. So please, I leave the floor to someone else. I don't wish to say the two hand here. Uh, chime in uh, one uh, short uh, thank you to you, Lucia, and to the participants uh, of this group, uh, to Marco for uh, imagining a conversation that draws from so many different uh, perspectives. I, I do think uh, you know, it was the start uh, of a conversation. I wish we had time and uh, a bottle of wine to share, but uh, this was a good start uh, for the reflection we've been encouraged to do. Thank you, Betty. Thank you so much. Thank you very much also from my side. It's been a great um, listening to you. It's so rich and dense. We. Well, hopefully there will be some written contribution at, at some point, which uh, will uh, push the, the conversation further. Thank you very much.